there was daily paperwork, weekly paperwork, monthly paperwork, quarterly paperwork. So I just got four different colored trays, like really logical brain here, went down to the store and said, okay, daily paperwork, that's in the green trays. Fabulous person, Beata Shillette here, the growth architect. Welcome back to the Business Growth Architect Show where we bring you cutting edge business strategies from some of the world's most successful entrepreneurs, business transformation experts and visionaries who want to help you to scale your impact. Look for one tangible strategy that you can take back and implement right away. And now back to our guest. Hello, welcome everybody. This is your host, Beata Shillette, to another episode of the Business Growth Architect Show. Today, I have a, should I say, colorful, interesting, outspoken guest by the name of Brad Sugar. So, Brad, I'm going to turn it right over to you and tell them who you I are and what I, makes you you. It's if you're uh, maybe it's the Australian thing. Maybe that's what makes the colorful, the whole thing is. I was talking with some English people the other day and they were telling me, you know, what makes Australians so different? I said, well, you English sent all the fun people to Australia 200 years ago. You should know what makes us different. <laughs> um, look, you know, I've been coaching business owners for, since 1993 and uh, now Action Coach, uh, our organisation, we're in 83 countries, more than 1,100 offices, uh, coaching 280,000 business owners every week on how to grow their business. And so uh, 17 books, uh, four of them international bestsellers, five kids, uh, crazy life, crazy wife, and uh, my last name, Sugar, so you can imagine all the jokes. There you go. That's the fastest one, Beate. That's the, the easy way. My wife's maiden name was Brown, so you could imagine uh, uh, our, our surname, Brown Sugars, and and um, <laughs> my initials are BS. So there you go. So how, how, that's, Oh, that's I love that. I didn't even thing. think about that. That's right. The yeah. initial BS, that's that. that, that All I'm you need sure. in your life is a little BS. So there you yes, go. Yes, so. th there you go. I love that. <laughs> so um, I don't even know if you can answer this question in, in, in relatively quickly because there's so much about you that's worth uh, noting. So What's your claim to fame? What's the thing that made you you? What is your superpower, sweet spot, differentiation factor, unapologetic value pro proposition? What is it about you? Uh, I take complex things and make them simple. So there oh you go. God. I can answer it in one very fast sense. What I, I many years ago studied uh, Buckminster Fuller and Bucky Fuller used to talk about models and artifacts. He said, if you can't create it into a model, you don't really understand it. Einstein also said, if you don't... Uh, if, if, if you can't teach it simply enough, you don't understand it well enough to be teaching it. And so what I've always done is take everything and boil it down into a formulaic approach and break it down into the smallest parts. And I think that's where from a teaching point of view, I win. From a business point of view, I, I started out buying broken companies and fixing them. Nowadays, I buy good companies that are in one location and I take them global. So, you know, it was... It's sort of gone across the spectrum. Don't don't buy just the broken ones and fix them. Now find the good ones and and take them from one location to hundreds of locations. I just got off the phone call with uh, my partner in our HR business, and uh, he he's he's dying right now because we're finishing the business plan out, and he wanted to open twelve new offices next year. And I went through the logic of it with him. I said. There is zero reason we do not open 80 to 100 new offices next year. And he's he's sort of sitting there going, but, but, but. I said, well, logically show me why that doesn't work. And he logically went through it and he said, well, there's no reason we can't. So that's really what I do. I try and scale. I try and uh, leverage everything that we get to work with. So then the next question is going to be equally powerful in its answer. What does strategy mean to you? Dang. Um, in my latest book, I wrote a whole segment on strategy. When we looked at uh, the, the growth of a business that has exponential growth, so meaning year on year on year exponential growth, we found five core disciplines and we spent two years putting this book together. And so the one discipline of those five is the discipline of strategy. And I break strategy down into four main components. Uh, the first two look at your business model, and that is leverage and scalability. So the model of the business either needs to have leverage or scale, or they'll or it needs to have both leverage and scale. Now, leverage, by my definition, is uh, do the work once, get paid forever. Um, so if we look at that from a, an owner's point of view, 
there's employees work, which is do the work once, get paid once, which a lot of owners think they're an owner, but they only do employees work. Like the hairdresser that always cuts hair wonders why they don't make owners money. Well, because all you're doing is employees work. You work once, paid once. Then you've got managers work, work once, paid long-term, systemization, uh, planning, training, hiring, that management style work. And then you've got owner's work where you build a business that works so you don't have to. You build a business that uh, you can multiply. And from a product point of view, it's uh, the difference between, say, a rental business and a sales business. You know, like a, I have a commercial cleaning business. Why do I love commercial cleaning? Because you get a customer once they stay forever. They don't need to not have their business cleaned at any point in time. I used to have a dog food business. Now, if you're wondering, I've, I've owned over 56 different companies. So um, I currently own 11 companies. So I run them in two days a week, hence the leverage point of view. Um, my point though with that is if, if you get a customer once and they buy forever, then your product or service is structured correctly. If you get a customer once, they buy once and they disappear and you got to get a new customer or hope they come back, then you've structured your product or service incorrectly without leverage. Like if you look at uh, Apple versus Microsoft, Microsoft in the beginning, they made a piece of software that, you know, arguably not as great in the beginning, but hey, it was the start of an industry. They made a piece of software and sold it a, a gazillion times. Uh, Apple, on the other hand, was a computer manufacturer. They made a computer once and sold it once. They had to make another one to sell another one. You know, you can't just make one and sell it forever type thing. When Jobs left or was fired, um, Jobs came back and he'd run Pixar. So he built a movie business. Now he knew then make a movie once and sell it forever. I mean, he sold that to Disney for billions. And if you talk about a company that understands strategy, Disney is the geniuses of, of leverage in particular. Um, how many ways do they sell the mouse? How many, when they get a movie, they get you. So I got five kids. So I know two of my young daughters, when they did Frozen, oh my God. God, how many different ways did I buy frozen material type thing? You know, it's like every dress, every doll, a hundred times over. But the reason I come back to that point is when Jobs came back, he moved them into the music business, you know, and he said, you know, do the work once, get paid forever. No, Jobs is even smarter than me. He's do the work, never get paid forever. So you think about that, like they've never made a song and they sell gazillions of them. And, and then, of course, they got even smarter. They don't sell you the song anymore. They rent it to you. You pay for Apple Music once a month and, and hey, presto, Disney does the same. Now they all do the same. So that leverage is a very big part of strategy. Your model of your business, you know, like a, a licensed business, a franchise business, a rental business, a, a, a business where you get the customer once they pay and stay forever type thing. Then the scalability, my definition of scalability is the next sale costs less and is easier. Meaning that as you grow, the business should grow faster and faster, not slower and slower. And we see that with a lot of business models where the bigger they get, the slower their growth gets because they just, they don't have a scalable model. And, and scalability, you know, a lot of it comes down to removal of humans. You know, how do you get less and less dependency on humans and more and more dependency on systemization and technology and all of these sorts of aspects. So those two parts of strategy are the business model. And then the two other parts of strategy come down to the product or service, and that is marketability and opportunity. Opportunity has to be massive. There's no use going into a business where, like if you're in a small town and, and there's only you know, a total market value of $2 million a year and there's already four competitors, you go in there, what are you fighting over? The scraps of the four competitors type thing. You've, you've got to look at a business that is, has opportunity that's massive. And that's why I rarely look at a business these days that I can't take global. I rarely look at a business that I can't take to at least India. Uh, India is the fastest growing largest economy. If we break the world down, America's is a billion, Europe's a billion, Africa's a billion, Asia's four billion. So, you know, if I can't do that, then I'm going to struggle. And then marketability means the product or service has to sell itself. Uh, I don't want to have to be convincing people to buy. I go back to my commercial cleaning business. I don't have to convince, convince you, Beate, to, to get your office cleaned. You're already convinced. Your question is, who are you going to buy it from? And so I love businesses like that where I don't have to convince. All I have to do is get you to buy from me type thing. And so those are the four aspects. They're all in my latest uh, Pulling Profits Out of a Hat. That one, that book right there, Pulling Profits Out of a Hat. So I, I wrote that plus the other four disciplines in that book.
I love that. Um, I mean, I do a lot of business model work. I don't think I've ever heard the leverage idea that uh, I, I'll, I'll definitely be right there on on the list of of reading that because I think I do believe that the you know, what I'm hearing from you, and this is sort of very contrary to what most people do, because most people have a passion, and then they build the business around it. And you say, <laughs> you're just laughing, actually, you're not even saying anything about that. No. So, so you, your, your viewpoint is to say, well, what do you, what do you, let's be smart. And let's take a look at the criteria this business actually needs to even have for me to be even interested in it. Yeah. Am I and even, you? even if you are going to do your passion, I want you to take your passion and think of it from a business perspective rather than a passion perspective. You know, when you take a look at your product, a good friend of mine, Peter Lick, for the photographic artist, genius photographic artist. But instead of taking one photo and selling it one time, he takes a photo and sells it a hundred times. Then he sells it in a different way. And then he puts it in a different way. And then he sells it, that sort of thing. So he sees himself more as a, you know, like for me, I see myself as an intellectual property business. How many ways can I sell my intellectual property? So there's a book, there's a podcast that we're doing right now and I'm selling it for free, but, you know, still I'm, I'm, I'm moving it out there. I then take it and it's like the Disneyfication of anything. How many ways does Disney sell everything that it sells? So if you do want to do your passion and people go into their passion because they hear that saying, you know, if, if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. And the reality of it is if you go into business doing what you love, you'll work harder than anybody else ever did. And you'll probably end up hating what you loved because you'll fail at it in business. And so it's that challenge of, you know, I, I say sell what the customer loves and you'll never work a day in your life once you finish the business type thing. You know, and my definition of a business is a commercial profitable enterprise that works without you. Because I build assets, not cash flow streams. Most people want to build a cash flow stream. I want to build something that works without me. So therefore, I have a saleable asset. So therefore, an investment firm can buy it from me rather than me running it for the rest of my life and being golden handcuffed. You know, Beata, you would see this all the time. The number of business owners that they make this crazy statement to their customer. Oh, I'm the owner. I'm always here. Call me anytime. And they do. Every day, all day, and you can't leave. You've trained your customers to lock you into the business. You want to train your customers to do business with your team, train your customers to do business, whether you're there or not. Um, and, and I think that's where a lot of people think they're building a business, but they're not. They're building a job for themselves and they work for the stupidest person in the room. Um, so there's you know, the bluntness. I, uh, there's know, the bluntness. I, I have a term for that. I call it, I call it mini me cloning. Yeah. So that's the business owner that then goes, if I only could find someone who yeah. was exactly like me, we could, we could do more. And I have a, a saying that whenever I work with somebody, I said, the first thing you need to know about me, no mini me cloning allowed. Yeah. When I wrote instant systems about systemization of businesses, what we looked at was breaking everything down because the, the mathematical formula for leverage is divide to multiply. If you divide everything down into its smallest parts and you fix all of the smallest parts. Now I learned this when I had, I was in the photocopy business and um, I, I sat there and the most experienced, when I got into that business, the most experienced person in the business, the best salesperson was working in the office. And I'm like, this doesn't make sense. You need to be up there making sales. Why are you down here? Well, I'm the only person that knows enough to answer the phone. And I'm like, Okay, answer the phone myself for a couple of weeks and realize that there were 17 types of phone calls, actually 16 types of phone calls. So I wrote 16 scripts, hired a 16 year old kid, put them in front of the scripts and they could answer it. Then I realized I needed a 17th script called the how to transfer a phone call that doesn't fit in the other 16 scripts. And so, you know, I hired that. And then I realized that that person also did all the paperwork. And I thought, same logic. Let me just do the same thing. How many types of paperwork are there? There was daily paperwork, weekly paperwork, monthly paperwork, quarterly paperwork. So I just got four different colored trays, like really logical brain here, went down to the store and said, okay, daily paperwork, that's in the green trays. Weekly, that's it. And then I had a black tray called the, I don't know where this goes tray. And every tray just had a description of, here's what you do with this paperwork. And you know, it, I'm pretty logical in that way. I don't try and think of it. If you break it down though, and going back to the mini me thing, I think the worst thing a business owner should do is hire someone just like themselves. You got to hire people to do the other jobs that you don't like doing. Uh, get those things filled first and keep doing the job you love doing. Um, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think this was a nice little tie into our next question. From all the strategies that you have, what is the favorite one? What's the one your go-to piece? 
Okay, so let's do that at two different levels. Let's do that as a business strategy, an overall business strategy, and then let's look at a marketing strategy, your okay. client acquisition strategy. Overall business, my favorite is franchising because I'm dang good at it. I'm, you know, I own one of the top, well, Action Coach is what, number 35 uh, ranks of the global franchises in the world. I've built, what, half a dozen, no, more than that. I own three already, so... Yeah, I've built a bunch of franchise companies over the years. I love franchising, wrote a book on franchising. That would be my favorite strategy because it brings together talent and capital. And, and your speed of growth is very, very high. To When you go corporate growth, you have to bring on all the people. You have to train all the people. You have to do all of that stuff. You have to raise all of the capital to be able to employ all the people and do that. So speed of growth at a corporate level um, you either raise a ton of capital so you can have massive speed of growth, or if you go the franchising, you can bring the capital and the, 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 the people on as the uh, business grows. The talent and capital are there. Um, from a marketing perspective, I would say my favorite strategy is what I call a host beneficiary, working with someone else who has the exact same database as me, but it is non-competitive to me and working out how we can both benefit each other by introducing our client bases to each other. So when I first learned this, uh, I was in the clothing business, uh, ladies clothing, and I found a hairdressing salon that just happened to be the hairdresser because we surveyed our customer base, our top A-grade customers, 30% of our A-grade customers got their hair cut at this one salon. So it was like, that's the salon whose customer base I need. So I went to her and I offered her a gift. It was coming close to Christmas time. I said, how would you like to give this gift? It was a beautiful silk kimono gown because I'd just been in Hong Kong buying. And I had a thousand of these things, silk kimono gowns. And they cost me $16 a piece landed in Australia at the time. And I said, if we give these away to every one of your customers, and she said, I can't afford to give those to my customers. I said, no, but all you have to do is write them this letter. I had a nice letter written out for her saying, thanks to them for being a great customer. I bought you this present for Christmas. All you have to do is go into Bennett and Douglas and, and they have your name behind the counter. You can pick out what color and what size, whether you want the long or the short one. It's sitting there. It's for you. It's my gift to you to say thanks for being a great customer. P.S. If you need anything with your hair before Christmas, give me a call urgently. P.P.S. If you've got any friends who need their hair done over Christmas, please refer them to us. We love great customers and obviously you're one, so we'd love to have another. We gave away 500 and something silk kimono gowns to her customer base. They all had to come into the store to get it. The average person bought $450 worth of clothing while they were there. So that's my favorite strategy. My current favorite strategy on top of that would be uh, what I call raise your hand marketing. So marketing is target offer and copy. Who's your target audience? What's your offer? And then what's the words or the picture or the, the, the graphics you use to do it? All I see on social media today is people not doing that. I see them doing target and copy. They forget the offer. So for instance, if, if I just like, when this podcast come out, Beata, once you and I do this podcast, I'm not gonna post a link to it. What I'm gonna say to people is, did this amazing podcast. And by the way, you should subscribe to her channel. She's phenomenal. She asked me some of the best questions on strategy and systems I've been asked in forever. If you want a copy, type the word strategy below and I'll email you the link. And so what I do is I then get people raising their hands saying, mm -hmm. hey, I'm interested in chatting with you. So then one of my team will chat with that person, open a conversation, get them on the phone with a salesperson and get them moving in the right direction. Most people would just post a copy of the link and go, bye. We don't know who's interested. We don't know who wants to talk to us right now. We don't know who thinks this is great. We don't know any of that stuff. So I always build a, a methodology of asking people to raise their hand when, when they're doing marketing. So especially with social media, especially with social media. That's amazing. I, I really like that. Um, adding the third piece that making sure the offer is actually aligned. I think you're absolutely correct about that. Uh, no BS, right? Um, that you- <laughs> Lots of I BS, had, actually. I was waiting for the minute I could say that in this interview. Um, that there really is a piece where, you know, I have a technique, I call it crawl into your client's head. And I actually, you know, teach that. It's like, you you got to really think about who this person is and 
and here they are and they're completely overwhelmed and the kids screaming and, and something just fell off the table and the tire blew up and the mom's in the hospital and then you call, right? What do you have to say to, to make them pay attention to you? Yeah. But I well, like that. You if take we it, it over. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So you take it all the way and then you say, well, not just what do you have to say? What do you have? What are they willing to buy in that moment yeah. from me? Yeah. I want them to self-identify themselves as a prospect in that moment. There's yeah. plenty of suspects out there. If you look at um, yeah. in uh, what, what book was that in, in uh, my book, Instant Repeat Business, we talk about the ladder of loyalty. And when you take someone from being just in your target audience to actually raising their hand and saying, hey, I'm interested and I'm interested now, it's a totally different thing. Because what, what marketing is, it's the buying, of, it's the profitable buying of lifetime customers. So you have to invest money and if you invest, say, $1,000 and you get 10 new customers, well, you just spend $100 buying each customer. And your job is to obviously make more than $100 per customer or reduce your acquisition costs so that you're actually making enough money to make a profit out of each customer uh, and that sort of thing. And that's where a lot of business people will be out there. They don't, they don't even bother learning marketing. They think marketing is an expense. Marketing is the world's best investment if you do it right. If you buy a customer for X and they spend Y, you're the, you're the best genius marketer there is. Marketing's math, my friends, not, not uh, creative. Right, but you, you, you know, and, and that will require for you to actually apply some sort of logic and not too much emotions <laughs> to your business, which I think is a big issue for a lot of business owners because to them, it is an emotional extension of mm -hmm. their passion and who they really who they really are. And on that subject about passion and emotions, let's switch uh, the gears here for a second. You're a big family man. So, uh, <laughs> well, I so, have five so, kids. It's pretty hard not to be. Yeah. Right. It was hard not to, uh, to miss that one. So how important is family? Because you you strike me as somebody who's like really, I don't want to say hardcore business because that's judgmental, because that's not what it is. But you know your shit. You go for what you want. You got a formula, and you are going to be using this formula, right? Mm. How do you shift? How do you get out of it? How do you make it about family? How do you make it about what's important and what is well, important to you? Business is all about family. The business is a vehicle to provide you with the lifestyle to be with your family, to be with your friends. Business isn't, you know, one of the interesting things when I first moved to America um, in 1998. And I was sitting, uh, having a chat with a guy at a bar and uh, I'd, I'd been opening the business here and I was traveling a little bit and he was the CFO of a company and he, he described how his whole life was working at a job he didn't like to provide for a family he didn't know. And it's like the whole aim of business is to give you more life, not to take the life away from you. Business isn't your life. Your life is external to business. Business is an asset that you create that pays for those things. The challenge is most people, when they go into business, get sucked into the thing so much, the tail wags the dog forever and a day. So for me, business is all about family. It's all about building something. You know, with all of my businesses, I still work Tuesdays and Thursdays. And that's basically the way it works for me. I don't want to work. I want a long weekend every single weekend. I want the three months vacation that I take per year. I'm doing that because that's how I set my businesses up to do that sort of thing. Um, you know, my eldest is in, uh, my two eldest are in college and our miracle uh, baby is only three. So we're, we're a very <laughs> spread family. Um, you know, but th these are the things I like being... You know, if, if there was one award I could win in my lifetime, it wouldn't be Entrepreneur of the Year to be Dad of the Year. I'd prefer that award 10 times over Entrepreneur of the Year. Um, but one of the reasons I teach is because I see so many moms and dads, their business doesn't allow them to take vacation. Their business doesn't give them, like they miss their kids' football games and stuff because they're at work. And, and there's a great country music song a few years back called Don't Miss Your Life. And uh, yeah, I think that's probably an important aspect. The old idea and, and the 40, 40, 40, you know, work 40 years of your life, 40 hours a week to retire on 40% of your pay. That one never gave me any passion. And the old joke of, you know, being working for yourself is great. You get to pick which 16 hour days you work. 
you know, it's, it's, it's a crazy thing. And I, I keep coming back to this though. And that is that if you build it, you can build a business that works so you don't have to. And that's really my goal is to continually do that. I love, I take my kids to school every single morning. I don't miss that. That's what I want to do. I want to drive them to school. I want to have that 10 minutes of conversation time with the kids. They're locked in. They can't get away. They don't have their phone. (laughs) They don't have a TV. They're locked in with me. I've got them, you know, and that sort of thing. And so, but, you know, also friends, you know, you got to build friendship, but all relationships take work. People forget that relationships take work, but they also take learning. I remember when my wife told me our twins, who they're seven, when she said, we're having twins, I was like, oh, oh, Amazon books, how to raise twin, please. Because I didn't know how to do that stuff. But what it blows my mind, though, people who are parents who've never read a book on how to be a parent. It's, it's kind of crazy that way. But I think it's also why when, when I hit 50, I sat down and recorded all of the things I could teach about business and all the success principles of life and all of the stuff I could teach about wealth. And I recorded them all, put them into training courses. And, um, you know, I, I just make sure that my kids and my friends and everyone can learn everything that I've had the privilege of learning. Well, I, w- I will tell you, I, 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 I talk to a lot of very smart people and I talk to a lot of people that build business models, but you certainly in a category entirely on your own. And I mean this, you know, very heartfelt because there's something about you, and, and I, want, I want to point this out to our listeners that is really, really special because there's such a badass attitude about you where you go, come on, it's not rocket science, find the system, find the formula, write it out, uh, give it to people that know what they're doing that hopefully are better than you are at that, and you make sure you go home and have dinner with a family so you can drive your kids to school in the morning because after all, that's what you're doing it for. And I think that if we, you know, and I, I believe a lot in reverse engineering outcomes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So um, my my first question always is, what do you want? And I think it's very shocking how many, many people don't know what they want and therefore oh, yeah. we can't really kind of create that. So the clarity that you have, and, and this is really one of the points I want to want to point out in this interview, the clarity that you have is what you want mm-hmm. and what is your priority in what you want. And then, you know, you're bad assing, which is a, a verb, you're bad assing <laughs> your way <laughs> to, to actually making that happen so you can create that and then turning that into a formula that you teach other people. So if you are listening to this, you better be uh, getting the books and better be signing up for the courses and better be learning because there's something here that I have not heard and I have heard a lot. And wow. I see a lot, but, but you, you, and I'm, I really mean, this is very, very special. I'm, I'm very honored, um, uh, very honored to, to have, well, have, have done this. I, I love the way you ask questions and, and I'm, I'm honest because I listened to a bunch of your podcasts the other day preparing for this. And I wanted to make sure people understand that if, if you don't subscribe, you're crazy. You, you got it. Cause you interview some really unique people. There were some really unique ones. But, uh, you know, when you come back to that, I teach the formula of life success, dream, goal, learn, plan, act, know your dreams, turn your dreams into goals from your goals. It defines what you need to learn because you have to grow into your goals. You can't you can't make your goals happen magically. You have to become the person that creates the goals reality. So dream, goal, learn. Once you've done the learning, then you can write the plan. It's hard to write a plan based on your current knowledge because all you would write is do more of what I was doing before. So get that new knowledge, get the new plan and then go to work. And that's, that's really the thing. But um, I will make sure that we extend our Black Friday offer to all of your listeners. I'll make sure my team gets you the link for that because I think it's important for as many people as possible to keep learning and to keep growing. Jim Rohn taught me when I was 16. He said, if you read a book a week for the rest of your life, you'll be as successful as you want to be. So. I love that. And so how can we find out about you? And we also will put this in the show notes. But just uh, tell them right now, they're fired up. They listen to this, where they go now. Uh, Let's do this two things. Number one, anyone that goes on any of my social media and types Beate's name on anything, DM me, message me. I will make sure you get a copy of that that offer. And the second thing is you can dive on bradsugars.com. Easy to find me. Wonderful. Thank you so much. It's been absolutely amazing. You've been an amazing guest. Great information. 
and uh, you didn't hold anything back. I can, I can <laughs> tell everybody that. So thank you for being here. My pleasure. And this is it for today. It's a wrap. This is Beata Chalet, the growth architect. And until next time, thank you so much for listening. And that's it for us today. Thank you for listening and watching the Business Growth Architect Show. I enjoyed having you here. And for accountability, just take one of the strategies that you have heard, one thing that you can implement in your business immediately. Please leave comments. Don't forget to like and share this show. And if you have any questions about business, please put them in the comments. We are here for you. We're here to support you and help you to grow, build, and scale your own business. For more advice, please check out our website in the show notes below. Thank you again. This is Beata Chalet, the Growth Architect, and goodbye.